Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's October 18th. It's time for another batch of Deep Space updates. And in the last couple of weeks, we still didn't get our second launch of the Starship test stack. But we did have a whole bunch of other launches, starting on October 5th, when China launched a Long March 2D from Jichang, carrying another trio of Yaogan military reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit. Also on the 5th of October, there was a Falcon 9 carrying 22 Starlink satellites. That was Group 6-21 for those keeping track. Um, on the 6th of October, we had, uh, well, we had a rarity. We had an Atlas V 501, that's 5 meter fairing, zero uh, solid rocket motors and one, obviously, second stage engine. That was carrying a pair of Kuiper satellites. So Kuiper is Amazon's answer to Starlink, and they are just getting on to launching their first test satellites. These things were supposed to launch a while back. They were originally scheduled to launch on ABL's RS-1, but that's still uh, going through some development teething troubles. Then they switched them over to Vulcan, and that also is having teething troubles, so they sued up an Atlas V, they stripped off any solid rocket motors and they launched these two satellites. And we got the first look at these Amazon communication satellites. Also, interestingly, uh, the, while this is the last launch of the 501, again for now, um, they disposed of the Centaur in an interesting way. This was a mission to launch it into low Earth orbit. And then they just decided to burn the Centaur to depletion, taking it off into interplanetary space. I heard that it goes out beyond the orbit of Mars, which is quite impressive. I'm not sure why they decided to do this, but I'm glad that we, we have the you know, chance to experiment and push the limits. On the 9th of October, Europe gets back in the launch game for a little longer with the Vega. Not the Vega C. This is the old style Vega, which uh, they had two launches planned. So this is one of those. This is a rideshare mission carrying something like a dozen satellites. I'm not sure. Uh, payloads are Theos, Triton, Answer, Leader, and Follower 1 and 2. Uh, Est Cube from Estonia, Maxat, N3SS, Pretty, Roba. Um, yeah. And there was a couple of satellites, however, which did not separate from the launch bus and apparently returned to Earth. And that is unfortunate. I mean, that's down to the supplier of the, the mount hardware. Like, you know, nobody blamed SpaceX when it dropped uh, the Zuma satellite back to Earth. Anyway, yeah, that was unfortunate. They had a slight failure, but it wasn't really Vega. And as of right now, Vega is still the only launch vehicle that Europe has that is operational. 9th of October, there was another Falcon 9 uh, carrying uh Starlink, and this was from Vandenberg this time, sending it into higher inclination orbit, this part of Group 7 4. 21 satellites, of course, because they're going to higher inclination orbit. 13th of October, Friday the 13th, yes, we had Falcon Heavy performing its first mission for NASA, carrying the Psyche mission on its way to the metal asteroid of. Well, Psyche. It's going to take six years to get there, but yeah, if you want to know anything more about this, I did do a fairly detailed video on Friday the 13th that was 13 minutes and 13 seconds long. I, that was purely a coincidence, but I, as I said, I think this is the most metal launch that Falcon Heavy has ever done. I did also complain that during the live stream, the footage from one of the cameras on the ground showing the booster going transonic through the atmosphere was way out of focus. But NASA actually published B-roll, which included this another camera on the other booster in glorious 4K detail, and it is sublime. I posted that in the shorts. I love this footage. It's fantastic. Anyway, 13th of October, we also saw another Falcon 9 launching from Florida. So this was two Falcon rockets. Actually, four boosters launching within 24 hours of each other, if you think about it. I was, of course, launching another batch of Starlink Group 6. And uh, 15th of October, over in China, Long March 2D, carrying a Yunhai uh, weather meteorology satellite. This is the fourth of those satellites. I think there's like a couple of them are operational still. And yesterday, just after dark in Florida, they launched a Falcon 9 carrying Starlink. And this one, again... You know, it's another Starlink, but for me it was very special because I get tipped off that it was going to pass right over my house just after dark. And sure enough, we saw it. It was a single light, but when I zoomed in, 
I could literally see a very short trail with 22 Starlink satellites visible. It actually con uh, continued over, and uh, I don't know if you know Cody from Cody's lab. He just saw it randomly, said it was a fuzzy image, and according to Jonathan McDowell, this may have been because it was performing its deorbit maneuver. So it's kind of cool that a lot of people actually saw this thing. So anyway, those are the orbital launches. There was a couple of suborbital launches worth talking about. First of all, October 7th, uh, a Spanish company, PLD Space, they launched their Mayura suborbital uh, you know, sounding rocket. So they have been pushing this design for a while or working on it for a while. Uh, it was This first launch was supposed to go to 80 kilometers. Ultimately, they wanted to be able to go to 150 kilometers and provide short amounts of zero G. Unlike most sounding rockets, it's not a solid rocket motor. It is a liquid-fueled kerosene liquid oxygen rocket with a, a rocket engine that uh, uses a gas generator. Um, so anyway, this one, it was supposed to go to 80. It went to 45 kilometers. And according to the founder of the company, Raul Torres, uh, this was actually intentional. They put it at a slightly you know, steeper or slightly more shallow angle so that it wouldn't go as high, reducing the stresses. And they still hit the middle of their target site on their so in their hazard zone. So, you know, uh, that checks out. It isn't like something failed. However, they were supposed to recover the booster. It was supposed to soft land under parachute so they could recover and reuse it. But it appears the booster has sank. The other suborbital launch of note is VG04 or Virgin Galactic carrying three more passengers. These are some of the early adopters who got on the waiting list for the Virgin Galactic experience, including a guy called Trevor Beatty, who is an advertising executive that's always been fascinated by space. And he actually apparently worked on the original pitch of Virgin Galactic. So he, I've been seeing him on Twitter. It's been super exciting watching him be like all like, you know, like a kid in a candy store, super excited by the whole experience and uh, really publishing some great uh, images from this flight. Uh, but also just this afternoon, they announced Virgin Galactic Flight 5, which will be the final flight this year by the sound of things. And this is going to include uh, experimental stuff. So it's going to include Alan Stern as a NASA-sponsored suborbital astronaut. Alan Stern if you don't know, he was the principal investigator on the New Horizons mission. So he's an astronomer that actually knows a bit about remote sensing. I I'm not sure what uh, his experiment's going to be. I know at one point he was going to be testing hand-operated cameras and uh, you know various biometric stuff. Also on this is going to be Kelly Girardi, who is uh, another you know, going to be doing air science as well. There's a third astronaut, but I don't think I've seen that name. Anyway, uh, I guess the most interesting story uh, for the last few weeks has been the coolant leak in the International Space Station. Now, again, I did a fairly detailed video on that, and it seems that my uh, my guesswork was mostly right. This uh, coolant leak is in the secondary loop of the second rad uh, radiator system that helps cool the station. Um, it's specifically for the Nauka module. And it sounds like it's not really interfering with their science right now because there's just not enough going on in the Nauka. It is interfering with some spacewalks which were planned and are being uh, replanned at this time. And according to sources in the Roscosmos, they're, they're very seriously considering an attempted repair. So we might see a spacewalk to do that, but I would expect that if they're going to repair it, they're going to have to wait for supplies to come up. So it won't be any time soon. Uh, anyway, uh, in the last couple of weeks, there's also been a fairly big event, the International Astronautical Congress in Baku in Azerbaijan. So there's been a lot of stories coming out of that, like uh, Axiom Space saying, hey, you know those spacesuits that we're making? We're going to work with Prada. Yes, you know the fashion label. And you might scoff at this saying, oh, they're just doing this for PR. But I, I'm going to say, as someone that's watched a lot of Project Runway in my time, there's a lot of technology that goes into fashion, a lot of understanding of structure and mechanics. So having them work on a spacesuit, having them help, is prob might, might give something to it. You've got to remember the original Apollo suits had uh, you know underwear designer Playtex as one of the principal designers. So 
like the links between spacesuits and fashion aren't that far. And frankly, I think it's very important to go beyond your immediate skill set to get all the knowledge that you need. I mean, hey, I'm an astronomer that works in computer science and talks about rockets all day. Uh, the other one, I guess, from the Baku thing is uh, China had a big thing about their space station, their future plans. So they said the current plan is that they are going to extend their space station. They're going to launch like a, a there, it sounds like they're going to launch a new adapter at some point. Um, and that will then allow them to bolt on at least three more modules, bringing the space station mass to something like 180 tons. It's still a lot smaller than the International Space Station, but it shows that they're fairly ambitious. Now, they are also still planning to launch the Zuntian uh, Free Flying Telescope next year. That's something like the Hubble Space Telescope, but the idea is that it will be able to co-orbit with the station. It will be able to come in, dock to the space station like externally and be serviced in EVA, and then detach and go off and do its astronomy for a while and then come back and get its experiments, its hardware instruments changed out. Northrop Grumman, they're probably, it, well, it sounds like they have dropped out of the NASA's sort of private space station race. They're no longer planning on doing their own thing. They have thrown their lot in with Voyager Space, who uh, have their own space station going. Uh, so they'll be contributing the Cygnus cargo spacecraft, the Antares rocket, to supply it, and that will uh, that will no doubt make Voyager space a, a bit more you know competitive. Federal Communication System placed a historic one hundred fifty thousand dollar fine against Dish Network for allowing their Echo Star Seven satellite to run out of propellant enough that it was unable to reach its target disposal orbit. So Echo Star Seven launched two thousand two. It sits out in geostationary orbit. Now, you don't deorbit things in geostationary orbit. You send them out to a graveyard orbit a few hundred kilometers above geostationary. And they had a, an operational plan that was going to begin this graveyard disposal process in May of 2022. But as they got to the start of 2022, they realized they weren't going to have a the propellant, so they quickly talked to the FCC. They raised it as far as they could, but it wasn't far enough. So uh, they got fined one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which frankly isn't that much. But I would hope that if if this happens in the future, the fines just keep getting bigger until people get the message. This is the yeah, first time I've ever seen a fine for space debris. Uh, also, out at geostationary orbit, Viasat have been working through their various problems. It sounds like the Viasat 3 with the antenna issue, they've confirmed that they can get about 10% of their expected performance. So that should be about 100 gigabits. And presumably that means that they're not going to get all of the $420 million insurance on that. They'll probably get, you know, about $380 million if I, my math is right. Um, they also still have $348 million worth of insurance on Inmarsat 6, which failed to reach its final orbit. This is a bad year for uh, insurance in space. Uh, yeah, and also there, there's news about four other satellites that have electric thrusters. The uh, ya, was it, Yaha 3, uh, the Avanti Communications Hylas 4, and Northrop Grumman's mission extension vehicles one and two. Those are the ones that come up and they dock with another satellite and they keep it in orbit. So it turns out that all three of these spacecraft have electrical propulsion systems that are using power uh, management units, which have been failing. Three of them have had one of their units fail. They've got redundant units. They've now had to cut the power back. This is going to affect their on-orbit life. And so there's going to be some insurance payouts for that as well. Yeah, um, OSIRIS-REx, yes, of course, I talked about the return last time. OSIRIS-REx, they had the the sort of the big moment where they showed all their, uh, they, they had the scientists talk. And <laughs> I think, well, it had, I had expected them to have pulled out the whole sample return canister by this point. But it turns out there's so much debris scattered around the interior of the capsule that they are trying to document every single piece of this. And so they've been taking little bits out and analyzing it, and they found, you know, carbon, water, amino acids, uh, and they still haven't actually got into the core of the of the sample canister. So 
the, currently the mass estimate is about 250 grams. And you might say, well, come on, surely they can just weigh the capsule before, they know what they weighed before, they know what it weighs after, surely they should be able to tell, tell the difference. Well, the capsule uses ablative heat shields and ablative heat shields, as they heat up, they emit gas. So the mass of the heat shield is changing. That's why they can't just do this simple comparison because they need to know how much of the heat shield that they've lost. Also, in the last month, Astrobotic had been doing some tests down in Mojave uh, with the Zodiac, right? Now, you might remember the Zodiac. That was built by Mastin Space Systems. They went out of business, or well, they went bankrupt, and the assets were acquired by uh, Astrobotic. And David Mastin, who had been the founder of Mastin Space Systems, is like now the chief technical officer of the, the landing propulsion people. And yeah, they've been doing a bunch of hover tests down in Mojave. They did that last month, but we actually got some really cool footage of it. And this is in part to support research by the University of Florida, including Phil Metzger, who's a cool guy that you can follow. He is interested in uh, debris, right? Is what happens when you fire a rocket engine into loose ground and you see debris flying around. Yeah, he was really interested in the Starship launch and he wrote a paper on that. But yeah, they're looking at how this works uh, on the ground with various uh, landing pads that could be created for the surface of the moon. So yeah, great little footage from that. They are confirming that they're continuing to develop this towards a working vehicle. Yesterday, Blue Origin announced another piece of hardware, Blue Ring, which to me looks like a spacecraft bus. It's going to provide propulsion and power. You can bolt payloads onto the side and those can either get powered or they can get carried to their target orbit and deposited. So this is very similar to space tugs or spacecraft buses we've seen from other companies. And it'll be really great when this actually flies when you don't know when that is. India, oh yeah, India, they have uh, announced their very bold plans going forward. So first of all, India, in the next few days, we are expecting them to test the flight, in-flight abort system for their Gaganyan you know, crew vehicles. So they're going to launch a thing, they're going to perform a separation and demonstrate that the capsule escapes and returns safely to the surface without uh, potentially accelerations that could kill the crew. But it, as part of this, they also announced that they are... Definitely still on for crew flights in 2025, and they're aiming to have a space station in 2035 and people on the moon by 2040. That would be really cool, but you know, we all know that these dates tend to move right rather than left. And of course, speaking of dates that continuously seem to be moving to the right, Starship, yeah, uh, we, we haven't had a license officially approved at any point, but there was like a big powwow on Capitol Hill where a bunch of interested uh, parties from private space flight got together to testify before Congress about how uh, the FAA needs more staff to help work through the, the licensing issues. And, you know, it's not just SpaceX that are waiting on licenses. Uh, you remember Varda Space? I think their capsule is still in orbit. They haven't been given a license to deorbit it. Now, that may be down to poor planning by Varda Space, who maybe launched it without having an approval for a return. But uh, uh, yeah, SpaceX, obviously they're looking for a flight you know, license for IFT2, an in-flight test. Um, we do know that the Fisheries and Wildlife Service, who were brought in after the rock tornado, they have delivered their report and the FAA has 30 days to respond. So that puts a potential earliest launch in early November. And uh, this morning we began seeing marine hazard warnings starting November 1st. So maybe we are once again getting close, but yeah, still, I'm still not betting on this happening anytime soon. I, you know, I keep on saying, oh, next episode we'll have this launch happen. Yeah, I'm at this point I am jaded. It's not going to happen until it surprises us all. But we are going to continue watching it. And of course, when it does happen, I will have all the details and all the footage. But until then, yeah, we just got to hold on and wait. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.